Welcome to Worship with Trebridge Digital Salvation Army. We're really pleased that you've chosen to join with us for worship today. If you were with us for our online worship last week, you may recall that we looked at the theme, Seeing with the Eyes of Jesus. Today we turn our attention to our speech as we consider the theme, Speaking with the Words of Jesus. As we gather for worship, we want to bless the Lord. We want to reflect upon, speak about and sing about our love and our praise for him. And so we turn to our first song for today, an old hymn, which says, Stand up and bless the Lord with heart and soul and voice.
song reminds us of the many reasons we have to praise the Lord. But it also reminds us that we worship him with every part of our being, with heart and soul and voice, with every aspect of our lives, our home life, our work, our leisure, and at all times, in the good, the bad, the ugly, the difficult, the mundane times of life. And you know, it's not just about singing songs on a Sunday, is it? It's actually about a whole life of worship. And we have to consider what that means for each one of us. We have an opportunity to think about that as we turn to our next song. It's a very personal song, which gives us an opportunity to make a fresh commitment to the Lord, a fresh commitment to whole life worship of God. And perhaps it also gives us an opportunity where we need to repent of the times and the aspects of life when we have not worshipped God as we should.
Dear Lord, we come before you now and we pray that our worship will be acceptable to you. We have so much to thank you for and so we want to bless and honour you and your name in word and song just now, but also in the way we live our lives and conduct ourselves day to day, in every conversation, in everything we do, everywhere we go and with everyone we meet. We are sorry for the times that our lives have not been a reflection of our love for you, our gratitude, our worship. We pray for your forgiveness and ask that you would teach us the right way. Lord, we commit ourselves afresh to you, realising that you must have control over every aspect of our lives, for that is our true act of worship, and that alone will enable us to reach our potential in you and for you. So speak to us, teach us, guide us, to be a people of total praise and worship. Amen. We turn to another song just now, another song which talks about a whole life of praise and worship. Again, it's not just another song, but it is essentially another prayer. A prayer to God so that every part of our being, our life, our time, all of our life, in fact, will be an acceptable act of praise and worship and of witness to God and his amazing love. This song does, however, have a couple of lines in it which refer directly to our words. And after we've sung together, we're going to turn to scripture. We're going to listen to scripture from both the Old and the New Testaments, which will help us focus on the importance of our words and how they should reflect our relationship with God and be used to praise and worship him. The readings also remind us that what comes out of our mouths is a true reflection of what is going on in our hearts.
Psalm 19 verses 1 to 4 and 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Matthew 12, verses 33 to 37. Make a good tree and its fruit will be good. Or make a bad tree and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognised by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks with the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. We're going to listen to the international staff songsters singing Graham Kendrick's Teach Me to Dance. It is another prayer, asking God to help us ensure that every part of our lives is completely in tune with him and his heart, so that ultimately we praise and worship him with every part of our being. You can listen, you can sing along, the words will be on the screen, and you can even dance if you want to. You can really dance like no one else is watching, in the comfort of your own home, all as an act of praise. Come from the book of James, James 1, verse 26. 
Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. James 3 verses 1 to 18 Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal, or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of, the, out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives, or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Though who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humanity that comes from wisdom. But if you harbour bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Amen. Do you remember the children's rhyme, Sticks and Stones? When I was a child, we said it like this. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never harm me. This phrase is believed to have first appeared in the Christian Recorder in March 1862. This was a publication of the African Methodist Episcopal Church and it included this old adage in this form of words. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never break me. The rhyme was intended to persuade child victims of name-calling to ignore the taunt, to refrain from physical retaliation, to remain calm and good-natured. But of course we all know the reality that words can hurt us. Name-calling, insults, unkindness expressed verbally, all of that does harm us and can break us. I'm sure we've all experienced it. And even now, like me, you might be recalling incidents of that that you've experienced over the years. I wonder if your parents used any of these phrases when you were a child. Or perhaps as a parent, you've said them to your children. If you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. And... Think before you speak. Very wise words, I'm sure you'll agree. Words which we as adults would be very wise to adhere to as well. Well, we've been thinking through our songs and our readings in this service about our speech, about our words, what we say and how we say it. Does it encourage and build up or is it harmful and destructive? Our tongue, our mouths, our words all have the capacity to be forces for great good or for great harm. Their potency is such that they can change a situation in an instant, leading to tears of love and joy, or to tears of pain and fear. 
The imagery that James used is very helpful in helping us to develop these ideas further. As the bit in the horse's mouth or the rudder of the ship, as they control the direction of travel, so the tongue, and therefore our speech, has the capacity to control not just the direction of a conversation, but the course of a life, our own or someone else's. And it can do that for good or for ill. As a tiny flame is responsible for a raging forest fire, so too can our words be all the fuel that is necessary to totally destroy lives, our own or others' people's. A flippant remark, a badly chosen joke, using a particular tone of voice, sarcasm, negativity, abusive language, getting involved in gossip, all of those things could be the spark that damages us and others. Another simple illustration shows the lasting effects of our words. Imagine this, a toothpaste tube, squeezing out the contents and trying to get them back in. You'd think it'd be very difficult, wouldn't you? Well, let me show you. So here's my toothpaste tube. I'm going to undo that. And I'm going to squeeze some onto this plate. And we'll see if I can get some, all, any, none of it back into the tube. Nice big dollop there. And here I have a spoon. So I'm going to spoon some of this from the plate and see now if I can get any of it back into the tube. That first bit might be okay. That's not too bad, maybe. Hmm. More difficult than I thought, actually. I thought it was going to go in, but you can see it's really not. There's more ending up on the outside of the tube. I'm trying to squidge it in with the spoon there, and it's not really doing what it should. As I say, more on the outside than the inside. I'm going to put the spoon down and uh, give a go with my finger. I know that's not very hygienic. Perhaps don't do this at home. Maybe some of it's gone in, but certainly not all of it, has it? And it is a big gooey mess. There is still some on the spoon and there is still some on the plate too. Don't... Yeah, there's more on the outside of the tube than the inside and on my finger. Good blob on the spoon still and a decent blob left on the plate. I think all of that shows that it is nigh on impossible to get the toothpaste back into the tube once it has been squeezed out. Just going to clean off my fingers there from the mess that we made with that toothpaste. And you know, so it is with our words. Once they are out there, once they've come out of our mouths, they can't go back in. Once we've said what we're going to say, we can't put it back in. Once our words are out there, then they are out there for all time. And so they will be pondered on for all time. They will either be cherished or they will be despised. The words that we have said, the things that have left our mouths, cannot be unsaid and they cannot be unheard. In recent years, a quotation from Laurie Deshaney, a self-help writer, has been doing the rounds on Facebook. And I think it's very helpful when we consider the impact of our words, just to take a quick look at this. It's called Practice the Pause. As Christians, I'm sure you'll agree that all of this is even more pertinent. Do our words and our ways of speaking lead people towards Christ or away from him? The clue to what the answer should be is in our name, Christian, followers of Jesus Christ, disciples of his, with the sole aim and desire of becoming like him. That means that every aspect of our lives should reflect that we belong to Jesus, should demonstrate that we're trying to live as he lived, should tell people that we're modelling our lives on him. And that should mean that our words and our actions should reflect Jesus' words and Jesus' actions. Now that is a tall order. But it is what we're called to do and to be because it's what Jesus taught and it's what Jesus still teaches. This life of Jesus following is a whole life discipleship. It means that our relationship with Jesus, our faith, our application of scripture, our obedience must be evident at all times, in all ways and in all areas of our lives. And there are no options here. We can't behave correctly and do all the right things, get involved in all the right actions and activities, but then say what we like 
Equally, we can't say all the right things, but then behave as we please. And we can't do and say the right things in public, but then do as we please behind closed doors. Jesus had lots to say about that kind of living and about those kind of people who did and indeed do live like that. He called them hypocrites. And he made it clear that such living and therefore such people did not and do not belong in the kingdom of God. And therefore we must avoid becoming like this. Jesus said this, be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, that is hypocrisy. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight and what you have whispered in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the roofs. He said this in Luke chapter 12 verses 1 and 2. Every part of our lives then, the public and the private, must reflect our relationship with God. And the fact is that every part of our life does reflect our relationship with God. So if something is not right, if words don't tally up with actions or vice versa, then I would suggest that we are not right with God, that we have not let him invade and control every part of our lives, that we have not submitted totally to him, that we have not allowed him to freely enter our hearts. As Jesus made clear, it is the heart that is the centre of our being, and all else is controlled from there. Words and actions are affected by what is in our heart, so the heart must be right with God. We must allow God to reign there if all parts of our being are to be in harmony with him and each other. This is the only way for there to be no contradiction and no hypocrisy in us. It's the only way for there to be no sin in us and for us to be able to be like Jesus. Jesus knew it wouldn't just be God that would judge us this way, that it would also be the non-believer, for they will and do look and listen to us very closely. And they will make their own faith-based decisions based in part on what we do and what we say. So Jesus' warnings are for our own sake, for the sake of the kingdom, for the sake of the non-believer. And this is serious stuff, friends, for when our words and our deeds don't match, when they don't reflect what Jesus would say and what Jesus would do, then we sin and we put another nail through his hands and feet on the cross. By our wrongful behaviours, by our wrongful words, we betray him, we deny him, we bear false witness to what it means to be a Christian and we lead others away from Christ. How shameful is that, that our words and or deeds might cause another to turn from Christ? We've all heard it said, when someone has heard what we've said that is not so kind, when they've seen the not so nice thing that we've done, well, if that's what Christians are like, I want nothing to do with them. We have a duty to Christ, to fellow Christians and to the one who doesn't yet believe to bear true witness to the life of Christ, to bear true witness to the life he calls us to in word and in deed. And we are strongly warned throughout scripture not to say or do anything that would cause others to stumble. Jesus himself said in Matthew 18, If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to the person through whom they come. Instead, we are told to encourage each other, as Paul wrote to the Thessalonians. Encourage one another and build each other up. We ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard amongst you, who care for you in the Lord and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive. Encourage the disheartened. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong with wrong. But always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Put simply... Mind your language, watch what you say and how you say it. Use your words positively and carefully for God's glory. To build up the church, that's you and me, to fulfil God's mission. Don't be the one who uses words to be disruptive and don't be the one who uses words which cause others to turn from God rather than towards him. The psalmist prayed that his words would come from his heart and be acceptable to God. Jesus made it clear that we would be judged by our words, which are clearly an indication of what is in our hearts. 
And James and other New Testament letter writers gave us further warnings and advice connected with our words, saying that these must be a true reflection of the truth that is in our hearts. So there we have it. We cannot escape it. We need to be better guardians of our mouths and what comes out of them. James explained that this is more difficult than taming a wild animal, for our tongues seem to have minds of their own. And we even manage to praise God and curse man from the same mouth, the very thing the psalmist was trying to avoid and Jesus was warning against. So what hope is there for us? James tells us to seek God's wisdom because this will give us all we need to control our tongues, our mouths and our words, and so ensure that our speech is acceptable to God and to others, that it is positive and not negative, and that it bears witness to our faith. James says, The wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Let us pray then for God's wisdom. Pray that the fruit of the Spirit will be evident in our words. May there be love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control in what we say and how we say it. And let us take wisdom from the God-given book of Proverbs, chapter 15, verses 3 to 7. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but harsh words stir up anger. The tongue of the wise adorns knowledge but the mouth of the fool gushes folly. The soothing tongue is a tree of life, but a perverse tongue crushes the spirit. The lips of the wise spread knowledge, but the hearts of fools are not upright. Let us demonstrate our love for our neighbour with our words as well as our actions, that is, speak to others as we would have them speak to us. As Paul said to the Ephesians, be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. And let us take every opportunity to show that we are followers of Jesus through our everyday conversation. As Paul said to the Colossians in chapter 4 and verse 6, Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. But let us also speak specifically of our faith, using our tongue, our mouth, our words as mission tools, following the advice of Peter to choose words and the means of speaking, appropriate to the message that we are to give. From 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 15 we read this, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against you and your good behaviour in Christ may be ashamed of their slander, for it is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. We are human, and the tongue, and the mouth, and the words that come out of that mouth are powerful. We are often weak, and temptations will come. So when we are tempted to gossip, to use sarcasm, to respond curtly, even, especially if it's to criticism or to harsh words that have been levelled against us, when we're tired, confused or frustrated, let us remember that toothpaste oozing out of the tube and us not being able to get it back in. Let us remember that from a small spark a destructive fire can be set loose and wreak untold irreversible damage. Let us practice the pause. Let us pray and then and only then speak words of gentle encouragement as if it were Jesus himself speaking, as if it were Jesus himself listening, as if it were to Jesus himself to whom we were directly talking. As Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 11, if anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If we follow that advice, our words will be pleasing to both God and man, and they will have potential for great good, for we will be speaking with the words of Jesus. I invite you now to reflect upon your words and how you use them as we listen to a piece of music called May the Words of My Mouth based upon Psalm 19.
May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, be pleasing to you. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing. Here now I share two prayers for you to use as you reflect upon what this scriptural teaching and these thoughts mean to you. So I invite you to use these prayers to make your commitment to speaking with the words of Jesus. The first prayer is a masking prayer and at this time as we are asked to wear face coverings this prayer seems particularly pertinent and I hope it resonates with you as it does with me. Lord as I put on my mask let it be a filter for my words to pass through, as well as my breathing. Let through only those words which are helpful breathings of love, and stop those things in my speech that will be harmful to others. Protect me also, O Lord, from the harmful things others may say to me. Help me to realise that I may be a carrier of bitterness, thoughtlessness, judgement and prejudice without realising, and that some people are more word-vulnerable than others. Give me grace to love those who cannot or will not filter to protect others, and special grace to them, because they go through the world unprotected. Help me to be prepared to adapt, and to be brave and transparent, so that all may have a chance to hear. Lord, be a mask to my mouth, and pin my ears forward for listening. Amen. May God bless your conversations wherever they take place. 
May your words bring wisdom, compassion, comfort and peace, encouragement, change into someone's life today. And in the blessing given, may your life also be blessed. We pray that our words will bless and praise God, that our whole life will speak of our love for Jesus, that he will be heard in what we say and seen in what we do, and that others will be blessed as a result. Amen. God be in my head and in my understanding. God be in my eyes and in my looking. God be in my mouth and in my speaking. God be in my heart and in my thinking. God be at my end and at my departing.